Leo Tolstoy once wrote, the most difficult subjects can be explained to the most slow-witted man if he's not formed any idea of them already. But the simplest thing cannot be made clear to the most intelligent man if he's firmly persuaded that he knows already, without a shadow of doubt, what is laid before him. Included in life's most difficult subjects to understand, I expect we can agree, is God. And I'm wondering today what you think of Him, and why you believe what you do, and how you have formed the image you have of Him. And are you open to seeing something about God that you might not have known or seen before? Because in the story we're dealing with today, Jesus does something truly amazing and really unheard of. Something that has his closest friends and followers speechless and something that just might challenge some of the conclusions you've drawn about the nature of God. The title of this morning's message is The Servant King. When Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey, the crowds lined the streets. They laid their garments before him and they shouted, Hosanna, which means save now. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They hailed him on that day as a king, and they were right to do so, for he is a king. On trial before the Roman governor Pilate, Jesus did not deny he was a king. You may recall the sign that was made, the sign that offended many of his accusers, and yet it was ordered to remain attached to the cross on which he would die that read, This is Jesus, king of the Jews. He is a king. Like no other king the earth had ever seen, like none the earth ever will see until he returns. Now when you think of a king, what comes to mind? Robes, crowns, thrones, pomp, power, prestige. A man who literally occupies a place of esteem. Somebody who's doted upon all the time. Who barks orders who demands allegiance. Mike talked last week about the power of Pharaoh, and he just throws his chief people into prison if he's unhappy with them and kills them at will. Somebody, a king, is somebody who expects to be worshipped, expects to be waited on. Jesus is a king. But in our Bible reading from this morning, he shatters these stereotypes. We see the king of kings. And the Lord of lords, the creator, maker, sustainer of heaven and earth, kneeling down and in humility serving others. And this is what he came to do. His ministry is summarized in the key verse of Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verse 45. Becky read it for us this morning. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself his life as a ransom for many. Does that sound like the values of a king that you have in your mind? Does that fit with your understanding of how a king should behave? Jesus is God. Is this behavior consistent with your mental picture of God? Turn now, if you would, to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. The story that Rob read to us this morning which takes place in the final week of Jesus' earthly life, and is the account of his washing his disciples' feet. John chapter 13. Beginning in the first verse, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Now I want you to catch that last phrase. What is about to happen is a demonstration of the full extent of Christ's love. And that's going to take on some additional meaning here in a little bit. The evening meal was being served. So everyone is being served, okay? Jesus the Christ, the Savior, the leader of all these men, these disciples, sitting down at this table, being served with all his followers. Verse 4 says, He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. He got up from the table. That's actually an important piece of information. 
Because in Luke's gospel, we read of Jesus asking this question, for who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not, he says, the one who is at the table? What's he talking about here? What is he getting at? Listen, let's put it into a modern translation. Let's say the setting is a restaurant. Here's the question. Who is greater, the waiter or the customer? Who, 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 yes, if you work at the restaurant, you know who's greater, right? We have a saying, right? The customer is? I'm glad you filled it in that way. It could have gone bad for me right there. <laughs> the customer is always right. We put a little parentheses there, even if he's wrong, right? The customer is always right. The customer is the one who has the esteem. The customer is the one who has the sway. The customer is the one in charge. The customer is greater. The one at the table is greater than the one who was doing the serving. So Jesus gets up from the table, leaves this position of influence, lays aside his outer garments, wraps himself in a towel, and kneels down before his friends, and also, if you know the context, one enemy, one who would betray him. But in this setting, notice, you've got to love Jesus. He still treats him like a friend, like everybody else. He poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Does anybody have a reaction to that like I do? He kneels down to wash their dirty, filthy, sweaty feet. Foot washing was, by most accounts, a tradition of hospitality in those days, and to no one's surprise, it was also the job that nobody wanted. The task of washing feet was usually given to the lowest ranking servant in the house. Okay? The newbie gets foot duty. The least favored slave deals with feet. It, it didn't get much, it, it didn't get any lower than that. And that's the point, because that's where Jesus went. From the greatest position in the room to the least. From the table to the floor. From sitting comfortably and being served to standing up, to stripping down, and bending low. We see his descent in humility. He pours the water over his friend's feet. He washes them clean and he dries them with a the towel that he'd wrapped around himself. Now, the disciples are dumbfounded, I'm sure. And yet, to some degree, they were used to Jesus doing things that they didn't quite understand, like writing in the dirt with his finger while accusers with rocks stood by eager to kill a woman caught in adultery. What's he doing doodling at a time like this? Or making mud pies out of his own spit and putting them on people on the eyes of a blind man to heal him? Really? Talking with a Samaritan woman, you just don't do that. You're supposed to talk to those kinds of people. Inviting himself to the house of a tax gatherer. Yeah, Jesus wasn't always predictable in his actions, and, and this was one more that would require explanation. It was also deeply personal. Not one, something they expected from someone like Jesus who was as great as they knew him to be. But actually, he is here teaching them what greatness really is. When I got around to Peter's turn, you know Peter can't keep quiet. We don't have a record of anybody else talking, but Peter, he just cannot help himself. He has to weigh in, and he's like, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will. Later you will understand. Catch that phrase, too, because that's a clue that there's more here than meets the eye. No, said Peter, I'll not wash my feet. Maybe this beloved disciple thinks that Jesus is too good to do something like that, that washing feet is below him. Or maybe he thinks that he himself is too wicked, too undeserving to receive something so sacrificial from somebody as wonderful as the Christ. Neither of those possibilities should surprise us. We humans often think that of God as too pure, too high, too holy to want to delve into the common and even dirty business of our everyday lives. 
And we frequently believe, knowing ourselves better than most, that a truly pure and truly high and truly high God wouldn't want anything to do with us. Couldn't possibly want anything to do with us. Especially wouldn't want to serve us. But Jesus is showing us something different, isn't he? Peter won't have it. You'll never wash my feet. Little minor aside here from the life of Peter, little general wisdom for you, little tidbit. Be careful of declarative statements that include the words all, always, and never. <laughs> Peter makes them all the time. I will never betray you, Jesus. Ooh, we know how that went. You shall never wash my feet, he says, but Jesus is gentle, I'm sure. He's used to Peter and he loves him. And he gives Peter the big picture that, that Peter is just prone to missing. And he doesn't bow to Peter's terms and he doesn't change his mind. Listen, know this. God doesn't come to us on our terms. We come to him on his terms. And if we won't come to him on his terms, we don't come at all. We come on his terms, okay? So Jesus said, Receive this, or you're going to have nothing. Unless I wash you, you will have no part in me. Now, to Peter's credit, the very idea of having no part of Jesus was unbearable. So now he goes all the way to the other extreme, which is what Peter does. Peter just ping-pongs between extremes, never and always. Some of you are like that, and you can, you can relate to that, because you go from one extreme to another, and others of you are married to those people, and they drive you batty. <laughs> That's what he does. Yes, no, it's great, it's awful. What's going on, Peter says? Wash me then, wash all of me, not just my feet, but my hands, my head. Take all of me. He goes all the way. And when Jesus finished washing Peter's feet... And the feet of his disciples, he put on his clothes, John chapter 13, verse 12, and returned to his place. And he asked this question, do you understand what I have done for you? So let's go with that question. What just happened here? What has Jesus done? If you're filling in the blanks now and to follow along, you're going to actually be able to do that. The first is that he has given us a window into the nature and character of God. He has given us a window into the nature and character of God. People are often wondering, what is God like? And honestly, we make a lot of stuff up. I mean, we project a lot onto God that doesn't belong to Him, that comes from us. We've talked a bit recently about how we naturally lean towards making God, I say capital, I mean a small g here, making God in our own image, a God who reflects our values, a God who reflects our desires. We end up, when we do that, with a God that is so very easy to worship because He's just like us. And he require, because He's just like us, the only thing He requires of us is that we be ourselves. Isn't that wonderful? God is so cool, He's just like me. And we get along great. Okay? <laughs> So, we do that, that's, that's one thing we do, but there's another thing we do. We, we sometimes attribute to God characteristics, certainly that don't belong to Him, attributes that we don't like. We say that He's critical and He's judgmental and He's mean. We do this because in doing it, we create a deity that we don't like and therefore are justified in not bowing down to him and not worshiping him. Who would worship and want to serve a God like that? The concoction of our minds. You see, we jump through a lot of hoops, honestly, all through the spectrum here, but all for the same purpose, listen, to remain the God of our lives and not surrender to the one true living God. As the famous author Unknown is quoted as saying, Perhaps the reason some people have trouble finding God is the same reason a thief has trouble finding a policeman. 
the truth is, it's not up to us to create God. It's not even up to us to find God, really. He will find us. When He finds us, our job is to get to know Him. And we do that. We learn of Him by learning how He reveals Himself. And He reveals Himself in His Holy Word and especially through His Son, Jesus, who is, according to Colossians 1, verse 15, the image of the invisible God. You see, one of Jesus' purposes in coming to earth was to show us what God is like. He said, and it's recorded in John 12, when a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. You wonder what God is like? Look at Jesus. John 14, verse 9, Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So by washing the disciples' feet, then Jesus reveals God. He reveals the loving, humble nature of God. Second accomplishment in the demonstration of foot washing is that Jesus has set the example for his disciples. And that includes all of us who name the name of Christ. All of us who call ourselves Christians, who are learners and followers of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be a learner and a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus has set the example for his disciples to follow. And that's how I've always read this account. That's how I've always interpreted this account. Probably you've read it and interpreted it that way as well. Which isn't a bad thing. After all, Jesus says in verse 15, I have set you an example that you should do as, as, as I have done for you. So scripture interprets itself right here. Yeah, this is part of what this account is about. It's not all of it. Jesus has set an example. So listen to how Albert Barnes sums this up in his notes on the Bible. It is the manifest design of Jesus here to inculcate a lesson of humility, to teach them by his example that they ought to condescend to the most humble offices for the benefit of others. They ought not to be proud and vain and unwilling to occupy a low place, but to regard themselves as the servants of each other and as willing to befriend each other in every way. And especially as they were to be founders of the church, and to be greatly honored, he took this occasion of warning them against the dangers of ambition and of teaching them by an example that they could not forget, the duty of humility. It never hurts to be reminded, does it, to stay off that high horse of entitlement. To beware of thinking too highly of ourselves. To beware of ever believing ourselves above certain tasks, certain people. In 1878, Samuel Brengel, a Methodist minister who once fancied himself a bishop and held a fine pastorate, gave it up and crossed the Atlantic from America to England to enlist in William Booth's Salvation Army. Brengel later became the Army's first American-born commissioner, but he didn't start so well. At first, Booth accepted his services reluctantly and grudgingly and said to him, you've been your own boss too long. And in order to instill humility into Brengel, Booth set him to work cleaning the boots of the other trainees. And Brengel said to himself, have I followed my own fancy across the Atlantic in order to black boots? And then, in a vision, he saw Jesus bending over the feet of rough, unlettered fishermen. Lord, he whispered, you washed their feet. I will black their boots. This is the purpose of Christ's example. You see, in washing the disciples' feet, Jesus pushes us past the intellectual ascent that says it's a good idea to be humble and to serve others. And he inspires us to actually get out there and do it. Jesus is not holding out a moral ethic here that he wants us to acknowledge and agree with. As much as he is carving out footprints in which we are to step. 1 John 2.6 Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus is there a task too low? Is there a task too demeaning for us whose Savior and God stoops to wash filthy feet? 
Now, the third accomplishment of Jesus washing his disciples' feet is what he hinted at when he said, you don't realize what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Okay, the example they understood. He said that. He told them that. They got that. They could figure that out. They weren't the sharpest tools in the shed, but they weren't completely numb. It was obvious to them that Jesus was setting an example. That wasn't mysterious at all, but it only could be later. Listen, after they had seen him crucified, buried, and risen from the dead, only then would they and we understand that in washing the feet of his disciples, Jesus has shown us a picture of the gospel. Jesus is at the table. The table is in heaven. The table is heaven. And he is there. One part of the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is God the Son. From everlasting to everlasting. Present in creation. The one by whom all things were made and without whom nothing was made. He is in this place of prominence and eminence and influence. Everything moves at His command. And He leaves the table. And He strips off His clothes. He sheds His godly attire in the entitlements of divinity. He empties Himself, Paul wrote in Philippians, and He descends to make His home on earth, beginning as humbly and dependent as could be, the Word, that is Jesus, became flesh. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, God becomes a baby, birthed in a stable, laid in a manger for a crib, girt about with swaddling clothes. He dwelt among us. John writes. He dwelt among us. He lived with us. And we beheld His glory. Glory as of the one and only of the Father. Full of grace and truth. We've seen it. He was with us, John writes. And in dwelling on earth, Jesus did what you and I cannot do. I suspect we've proved this over and again. And that is lead a sinless life. Jesus led the perfect life. He was tempted in every way, the writer of Hebrews says, yet without sin. Leading up to his death on the cross, even that unscrupulous Pilate, the Roman governor and judge whose desire was for his own political ambition and popularity, told the ones who wanted Jesus killed, I find no fault in him. That's because there was no fault. And they killed him anyway. The sinless son of God. But listen now. Lest we think this was not the plan. Or consider Jesus an unwitting victim of man. Know this. It wasn't Pilate. Or the frenzied crowds. Or the religious leaders. Who made sure Jesus was on that cross to die. It was Jesus himself who made sure he was on that cross to die. To fulfill his father's will. In the same way that he left the table, poured water into a basin, to willingly set about washing dirty feet, he left the splendor of heaven, poured out his blood on a cross, to willingly set about washing dirty souls. And that is why Peter's objection and Jesus' response makes so much sense now. Unless, you, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. If I don't wash you, you have no part of me. This is not about feet anymore. Unless we receive Jesus' gift of salvation through the washing of our souls by His blood. Unless we receive by faith and believe He died the punishment for our sins in our place, we will forever have no part in Him. We will forever be separated from Him. To have no part with Jesus was unacceptable to Peter, who exclaimed, then wash all of me. And that is the response that Jesus is looking to get from us. Forgive me, God. Wash me. 
Wash all of me, every part of me. Cleanse me. Sanctify me. Clean me up and make me a vessel fit and ready for your use, O oh God. That's what Jesus wants to hear from us. When he finished washing his disciples' feet, John 13, 12 says he put on his clothes and returned to his place. That is, when he had fulfilled the task for which he had come to the earth to serve and to save lost sinners, to die the sacrifice for many, to absorb and, and satisfy the just wrath of a holy God offended by humanity's sin. When he died on that cross, they prepared his body for burial. They laid him in a tomb and they sealed it shut. But the grave could not, the scriptures tell us, Keep him. The scriptures declare, witnesses attested, his tomb was empty. Now, some of you I know, <laughs> you're like, hey, hey, hey. This is Palm Sunday. You're like a week early, Pastor. <laughs> we do Easter next week. Resurrection Day is next week. We celebrate the resurrection next week. Beloved, we celebrate the resurrection every day. We celebrate the resurrection every minute of every day that Christ has conquered death. We live in that reality. We love that reality. That is our hope. The tomb was sealed from the outside. It was guarded by Roman soldiers and it came up empty because Jesus defeated death rose from the dead, and walked out of that place. And by the way, he left those nasty grave clothes behind. At that time, he pretty much put on what he'd taken off to come to this earth. And after ministering to the multitudes for another 40 days in his new resurrected body, teaching them still about the kingdom of God and what they were to do in the presence of his dear friends, according to Acts chapter 1, verse 9, Jesus ascended back to heaven to the right hand of the Father. We might say he got up, put on his clothes, and returned to his place having demonstrated the full extent of his love. Therefore, the scriptures declare, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the gospel. The story of salvation in Jesus Christ. Available to all who would believe. So I have to ask, do you? Do you believe? Do you know this servant King Jesus? Is He your Lord? Is He your Savior? Are you washed? Are you clean? Are you washed in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? I want to invite you. If you don't know Jesus, or you want to know Jesus, or you just have questions about Jesus, to linger after this service. And tell me, don't just wait and think I'm going to pick up on this. I'm a man. <laughs> Tell me that you want to know more about Jesus. I want to invite you to begin to follow Jesus. I want you to sit at his feet. I want you to begin to understand what it is to mean his disciple. And I promise you will fall in love with him. And he will save you. And you will have an abundant life 
in this earth like no life you've ever known, and you will have eternal life. For as many as received him, to them gave he the gifts, the right to become the children of God. There is no reason for you to leave today and not know that you are a children, a child of God. We're going to sing a song, number 330, if you'd like to follow.